welcome you all to the interactive session with Mr. Vikram Limai, Managing Director and CEO of the National Stock Exchange. The NSC has come a long way since its inception in 1994. It was set up by a group of Indian financial institutions with the goal of bringing greater transparency to the Indian capital market and was the first exchange in India to provide modern, fully automated electronic trading. In 2017, it was the third largest exchange in the world according to the World Federation of Exchanges report by numbers of trades in equity shares in 2017. The NSE is also a pioneer in Indian financial markets being the first electronic limit order book to trade derivatives and the exchange trade funds or ETFs. The capital market is a segment of the financial system that accommodates institutions for the creation, custodianship, distribution and exchange of financial assets and management of long-term liabilities and gross fixed capital formation. It is the market through which governments, large companies and public enterprises lay, raise long-term funds. Thus, reliability of capital market gains significance in overall economic growth of the country. The inception of the SEBI with regulating standards matching those of the global capital market standards has also helped in diversified, vibrant, mature and efficient industrial financing systems in India. It has been able to stimulate economic development through capital formation processes as well. The NSE has played a cardinal role in promoting the level of capital formation through effective utilization of savings, through providing wide avenues of investment, a desired level of liquidity, and a safety of investments, providing financial resources for both public and private sectors. Mr. Vikram Limai took over as the Managing Director and CEO of the National Stock Exchange of India on 17th July 2017, and since then, there has been no turning back for the NSE. As he completes almost a year with the NSE, it has grown by leaps and bounds. As of April 2018, the National Stock Exchange had a market capitalization of over 2.27 trillion USD, making it the world's 11th largest stock exchange. It has grown at a CAGR of 17% since it started trading in 1994. Its flagship index, the Nifty 50, represents about 63% of total market capitalization listed on the exchange. Mr. Levi's achievements have been apparent in all his previous roles as well, be it as he navigated IDF, IDFC Limited out of troubled waters, or during his stints at Wall Street with financial institutions, global investment banks, international commercial banks, and global accounting firms. Moreover, he has also served as cricket administrator at the BCCI. Mr. Levi has never been afraid of accepting daunting challenges and coming out of them victorious. He is confident, he is quiet yet effective, he is process driven, he is a man on a mission, he is in a true sense an institution builder. With these few words, please join me once again in welcoming Mr. Lemai. I look forward to an interactive and engaging session with him. So today's format is a little different where it's more of an informal dialogue. So I'll kick it off by asking Mr. Lemai a few questions and then we'd like to take many more questions from the audience. Thank you. Good morning, Vikram. Morning, Shashwa. So Vikram, since, since its establishment, the NSE's significance as an emerging stock exchange has been eloquently borne out by rapid expansion in the quantum of funds raised and the number of investors in the primary market, the rise in market capitalization and the volume of trade and consequent entry of the FIIs. So when you took over the reins of the NSE last year, it was going through difficult times. Can you share with us some of the key challenges that you faced and how you overcame them? You know, at the outset, thanks very much for the kind words and I'm delighted to be here to talk to everyone. You know, the NSE is uh, an institution of national importance. Um, you know, as you said, uh, we've been in existence now for almost 25 years. Uh, any institution through its long history and evolution does go through certain issues. and. Um, the NSE has also had some issues historically. I'm in the process of sorting those out. Those are not entirely sorted out as yet. Um, I would say there were issues on multiple fronts, but if I were to characterize it in, in one simple phrase, it's really about stakeholder management. And uh, unfortunately, relationships with uh, many stakeholders were, uh, were not where they had to be whether it was the regulator, whether it was media, whether it was clients, etc. 
that had to do with a variety of things that uh, I don't want to get into. But um, stakeholder management and stakeholder relations uh, was an important area of focus. The other area of focus was really to strengthen controls and processes. You know, as you grow rapidly, very often what ends up happening is that as you're growing, uh, your processes don't necessarily keep pace with your growth. That very often then does result in certain issues along the way. Um, and so these are some of the things that, that uh, obviously had to be fixed in terms of once again strengthening the foundation of the institution for the next 25 years of growth. That process is still underway. It, it can't get completed in, yeah, in a year. But um, y y while you're doing that, you obviously also have to focus on what your core mandate is. And the core mandate of the NSC, the way I think about it, is to do whatever it takes to facilitate the growth of the Indian economy and whatever it takes to develop markets. You know, we have a very interesting role at the NSC and therefore uh, it's a complex institution from that perspective. We have an important regulatory role that we play. And then there is obviously the business side of it as well. So you have this uh, balancing act between being a regulator as well as, uh, you know, making sure that um, your business is also keeping pace because ultimately we have shareholders, we're a private entity uh, and shareholder returns and all the other stuff also needs to be taken care of. But the regulatory role is also exceedingly critical because that is important in order to make sure that markets develop in a disciplined way. So it's a, it's a complex institution and therefore uh, it comes with its own um, unique problems. But I would say that um, certainly we've made a lot of progress. There is more to be done, but um, it's a terrific institution. And as you, as you pointed out, um, it has contributed a lot to the development of the economy and the development of the country. And I'm sure we'll continue to play that role going forward. Thank you. Well, I think very interesting to see pretty much it's, it's, it's a similar problems that we face when we run our business as well, which is essentially stakeholder management. For, for our business, it's usually more internal, less external. And, and the whole thing about processes and settings was correct. Um, so what is your take on the Indian market and the growth ahead? And from an investment perspective, should investors be more cautious or can we expect a correction soon? So, you know, I prefer not to predict markets because I don't think that would be appropriate for me to do. Uh, what I can say is that from a medium to long term standpoint, uh, the India growth story is very much intact. I think uh, from a macro standpoint, the macro fundamentals over the last few years have improved significantly. Uh, in the recent past, there has been some deterioration largely on account of uh, oil prices moving up. Uh, but that's a, that's a cycle. So from that standpoint, uh, the, the macro fundamentals of the country remain quite strong in terms of whether it's the fiscal deficit, the current account deficit, the stability of the currency, um, I think even political stability, which is exceedingly important. And so from that standpoint, from an investor's perspective, I think India will continue to remain an attractive destination for making investments. It is growing at a fairly good pace relative to anything else in the emerging markets or even globally. And so I think over the medium to long term, India will continue to remain an attractive investment destination. Uh, in the near term, you will go through volatility. I think this year being an election year, you would expect more volatility and uncertainty. And uh, that will be reflected in how markets react, not only on account of domestic issues, but as I said, also on account of global issues, whether it's uh, oil price related or whether it is uh, geopolitical issues that crop up because we are ultimately integrated into the global economy. So we can't be insulated from what's happening around the world. And that will reflect in, in, in what's going on, whether it's emerging market flows, outflows from emerging markets, uh, what the Federal Reserve does in the United States, what happens in the Middle East, Iran, Korea, etc. So, I mean, those are all things that will have an impact on our markets as well. So, so, you know, as we become more of a global economy, of course, things like higher oil prices, rising interest rates from other economies will also affect the investments in the Indian market. So where do you think, the, where do you see the investments in the Indian market going today? 
so when you say investments in the Indian markets, I, I, so one, one point I'd like to make is that, um, you know, our markets today have a long way to go, just as a, as a macro statement. The reason I say that is, while our equity markets are relatively well developed, and I would emphasize the word relative, uh, I think the equity markets also have a long way to go. Uh, if you look at uh, the percentage of household savings in markets, it's only about 5%. You compare that to emerging markets, it's somewhere in the region of 12 to 15% of household savings that, that are in markets. You compare it to developed markets, it's more like 35 to 40%. So from that standpoint, obviously there is a long way to go. And that is on the back of a growing economy at 7% plus. So uh, that's as far as just the overall potential for markets to grow. Within that, as I said, equity markets are relatively well develop developed. The other markets are at very early stages of development, whether it's the bond market, the commodities markets, the currency market, all the associated markets that need to develop in order to provide uh, the hedging instruments, whether it's credit derivatives, interest rate, uh, futures, etc. So there are there is a lot to be done for market development. I do believe that uh, unless we get market development right over the next two, three, four years, we would seriously be compromising the potential growth of the Indian economy for the simple reason that I don't think we can grow at 8% plus just on the back of bank financing. And we therefore need to develop alternate sources of financing. There have to be other markets that need to develop in order to keep pace with the country's growth and provide uh, opportunities for a wider range of companies to get access to capital. And that is exceedingly critical, otherwise your economy can't grow. And so from that standpoint, market development is an exceedingly important thing over the next you know, two, three, four years, so that we have all the, uh, all the tools and all the uh, sources of financing in order to support 8% plus growth. So you know, when you look at 2017, I think there was pretty much like record fundraising from the IPO market. Um, and now when you see the SEBI is relaxed some norms, there's a huge push from governments on startups. We're still not seeing a lot of IPO in the startup space. Um, any particular reasons that you could pinpoint why you think that could be so? Yeah, it's interesting you ask that because just last week we had a meeting at SEBI and there is a dedicated group that's been set up to, to look into exactly uh, these issues. Uh, NSE, uh, as is doing its bit, uh, we've already had, held two technology conclaves in uh, Bangalore and in Delhi. There's another one that we'll hold in Bombay to educate the ecosystem, whether it's the VC community, their investee companies, founders, startups, bankers, lawyers, everyone that needs to know about what it takes to go public. And the fact that, you know, the Indian um, listing environment is now very different from what it was 10 years ago. And that startups and technology companies that want to think about a listing and want to look at an exit do have a very credible option in terms of listing in India versus thinking about the NASDAQ or uh, London or any other offshore market. So I, I would say that uh, the volume of investments that have gone into startups over the last five to 10 years has been quite significant. There will be several of them that will want liquidity. Um, the public markets uh, are obviously one option. Many of them do get bought by larger companies depending on the technology, uh, attractiveness, etc. Uh, but I do believe that, um, at least it's our hope, that over the next 12 to 24 months, there will be more technology listings in India. It also requires a certain degree of uh, maturity of the company. Uh, very early stage companies to list has, you know, they have their own risks and uh, you need to make sure that uh, the right kind of company lists. So, but we are facilitating that through, I mean, there is a dedicated platform for technology listings which hasn't really picked up the way it was envisioned. It was also set up a few years ago, maybe a bit ahead of its time. Uh, but we are looking into what can be done to facilitate uh, listings from a regulatory perspective and how that platform can be made. Uh, we can fine tune that platform based on what the needs are today versus what they were a few years ago when the regulations were formed. In that context, um, 
you know one interesting one interesting example is really how the SME platform has evolved and we have a dedicated SME platform called NSE Emerge. Uh, now on that NSE Emerge platform we've had more than 150 IPOs that have already taken place and SMEs are again you know not dissimilar to uh, startups. One of the main uh, constraints that they face in terms of growth is access to capital. And what we've done through the NSE Emerge platform is give them a platform to raise capital uh, and it's been exceedingly successful. I think uh, when you look at uh, investor experience in SME stocks over the last 12 to 18 months, that's been positive. The amount of capital that's been raised on that platform has been quite large. Um, the stock price performance of those companies has been quite good. And the pipeline is exceedingly strong. Uh, so there are a lot of SMEs that are uh, likely to get listed over the next 12 months. And we can try and replicate that success in the startup world as well. Uh, startups can also list on the SME exchange depending on you know the nature of the startup. So one of the things that we're looking at is rather than having one more platform, is it possible to create another segment on NSE Emerge which has potentially some additional tweaking of the regulations that caters to the startup community because they have their, their own unique uh, requirements and their own unique um, features in terms of their size and profitability and revenues and all that. So might require some tweaking of the SME platform rather than a separate platform because you've now got an investor base including institutional investors who are showing interest in investing in SMEs and I think the ecosystem now, as I said, relative to 10 years ago is a lot more developed when you look at the domestic asset management industry and their ability to invest in companies that are even uh, smaller and at earlier stages of growth. You have enough capital and enough expertise to, to take that kind of risk. And so it is, it is something that I certainly hope will happen over the next 12 to 24 months in terms of more technology listings in India. Okay, fair. No, absolutely. And, and so when you look at uh, NSE Emerge or, or other such platforms, you know, and, and like you're saying, you're hoping that you'll see a lot more investment going into the SMEs. Um, do you envision a lot of this being through institutional investments? Well, uh, if you look at the profile of investors on the Emerge platform, <coughs> it's, um, it, there are some institutional investors, but there are more HNI investors. And uh, the institutional investor participation is a more recent phenomenon, recent defined as in the last six months. But uh, there is, we are seeing interest from institutional investors. There are good quality institutional investors that have started investing in SMEs. And that trend will only grow. So uh, I, I think it will be a mix. It will probably start off more with the HNI uh, family offers, those kind of uh, entities. And there will be some institutional investor interest. And that grows. And it depends also on the size of the company and the size of investment, etc. Okay. So among the nifty derivatives, what is your flagship product? And what is your take on the future of derivatives in India? You know, the flagship product is obviously the Nifty 50. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, the Nifty Bank is another exceedingly pro popular product. In fact, if you look at the options of, on the Nifty Bank, it is, it is more than the Nifty 50. Uh, also because of certain tweak in, in the product structure. Um, so when we launched the weekly Nifty Bank options, th those were exceedingly popular relative to the monthly, which is on the Nifty 50. So um, Nifty 50 obviously is the flagship product and that is, uh, uh, that really is, is one that will continue to grow. Um, what was your, yeah, the future of derivatives. So, you know, this is something that uh, requires education. Um, you know, it uh, very often gets construed as um, excessively speculative, something that is not necessarily good for markets, um, something that needs to be controlled, something where a product where the common man seems to be taken for a ride, et cetera, et cetera. And there are many other versions of the same sentiment. The reality is, um, you know, derivatives are an exceedingly important part of any financial market. I don't think you could have a well-functioning financial market without derivatives. The primary purpose of derivatives is hedging. 
right? And as I said, as other markets develop, you will need to get uh, products and markets to develop that provide these hedging tools, whether it's the credit derivatives market or the interest rate futures market. These are all important. How do you hedge credit risk? There has to be a mechanism to hedge credit risk. How do you ra hedge interest rate risk? And that can only be done through derivative products. So likewise, you have to hedge equity risk. So the point is that derivatives are exceedingly important. Derivatives do provide liquidity to the underlying cash market. Uh, derivatives is, is something that when you look at it in, in the context of how they have developed in India, it's very different from how they develop globally. Uh, in India, uh, they've, you know, the derivatives market has developed under a lot of regulation and a lot of oversight from SEBI. Unlike in the Western world where most of it, if, if, not, if not all of it, is largely OTC and not exchange traded. In India, the derivatives market in equities is only exchange traded. And it comes with a lot of supervision, oversight, what kind of products get launched, are SEBI approved. You don't have complex, exotic derivatives, structured derivatives, instruments, the way uh, you have in the Western world that also partly was responsible for the financial crisis. Uh, partly because it was OTC, partly because it was too complex. Even institutions didn't understand the risk they were taking and what the embedded risk was because of the complexity in the instrument. That's not what we have here. We have very plain vanilla derivatives. You take an index derivative, your call is, does is Nifty go from 10 to 11 or 10 to 9? I mean, if you're not able to take that call, you ought not to be in the market in the first place. So my point is, you're not trying to sell anything very complex to an investor. Uh, if an investor has the risk appetite, understanding, etc., of what he's doing, which is the fundamental basis for any investing in markets, it's got nothing to do with derivatives. He shouldn't even be investing in cash equities or anything else if he doesn't have an understanding of the product. So it's not unique to derivatives. So I think uh, we have to look at the role that derivatives play in terms of liquidity, price discovery, therefore more efficiency in markets, providing a hedging mechanism to investors. And all of that is important. You know, market has different types of participants. All of them play a role. And all of them are important for the development of markets. Um, speculation is important and relevant for the development of markets. If all investors in the markets were one-year and five-year investors, you would actually not have a market. So you need liquidity providers, you need people who have different time horizons, you need people who have different risk appetite, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I think from that perspective, there needs to be more education. We're certainly doing our bit. It's a very large market. Uh, it has developed under well-regulated uh, uh, framework and oversight from SEBI. It is all exchange traded and therefore there's nothing hidden about you know what the derivative market is. It is transparent, it is traded on the exchange. And my hope is that in fact it develops even more for the reasons that I described and other types of derivatives become available for people to be able to therefore hedge, uh, hedge their risk. Um, so I would say derivatives markets still have a long way to go. There are various types of derivatives that are today not available, which should be available even for institutional investors to hedge risk. And the institutional participation in the derivatives market also has to increase significantly. Today, what you don't find is as much institutional participation as you would want. Uh, just take a simple example of the equity market. You know, insurance companies, including LIC, have huge equity portfolios. They are not active in uh, in hedging their portfolio in the derivatives market. That actually from a risk management perspective is, is the right thing to do. It also requires the regulators to allow some of these players to participate in derivatives. Uh, and so I, I do feel that from a product perspective, in terms of the structure of the market, in terms of participation, institutional versus retail, some of those things uh, do have some ways to go. So on what products can we do commodity trading in the NSC? And how, would you, how, how, would, how, how do you think commodity derivatives can help in deepening the market? So right now we're not in commodities. Uh, the SEB, uh, SEBI came out with the universal exchange 
guidelines only in December and they've permitted exchanges to be in all asset classes from the 1st of October. So from the 1st of October, we would offer commodity products as well. Uh, we will start with uh, the non-agri commodities as a start and then evolve into providing the entire range across non-agri and agri. Um, within the non-agri side, you know, the largest contracts are obviously in, in bullion and energy. Um, and so we will certainly focus on those areas and also metals. So those are the three areas that we will start with and then evolve into other areas, uh, including agri, as I mentioned. And then commodities market, again, has a long way to go relative to where we are. Part of it also has to do with, and this is a, a chicken and egg situation. So you need to build sufficient liquidity and you need to have enough uh, participation in the market for a market to grow. And right now, if you look at even uh, on the metal side, many of the large metal companies in India, the larger groups uh, hedge their risk offshore. Uh, that also has to do with the size of the uh, hedging needs and the liquidity that's available domestically. But over time, my hope is that we will get some part of uh, the hedging that happens internationally to happen domestically because that is important to grow the market. Obviously, as it relates to the mid-market growth companies and the SMEs and the MSMEs and all that, again, uh, there's a long way to go in educating those companies to hedge their risks uh, and, and for them the Indian market may be more relevant given their size, given their needs rather than hedging internationally. So I think again in commodities we have, uh, it's early days, so I think the market can develop in a very different way. Fair. And, and coming to forex derivatives, so what is the current scenario in forex derivatives? Actually. Uh, Exchange uh, currency derivatives also uh, are doing okay. You know, you have um, volumes of almost three, four billion dollars a day. It used to be eight to ten billion. Uh, the regulations changed along the way, and there were some constraints in terms of uh, how much exposure an entity could take on any single exchange, and therefore you had to fragment your exposure, etc. All that has now been consolidated, and you're able to take more consolidated risk on uh, on any one exchange, which is which my hope is will help in growing volumes. Um, so I think, you know, currency derivatives are doing okay. Just recently we were given uh, approval for cross-currency pairs as well, which we've launched in the market. Uh, the biggest product, which currently is not available, is the USD INR, which uh, for a variety of reasons, the Reserve Bank has some, has some issues in terms of permitting uh, trading in that freely although there is a large USD INR market that operates offshore. Um, but we don't have the entire flexibility to do, to do that uh, product domestically. Um, so now when you talk about foreign investors, you know, uh, what are some of the concerns that they see when they look at the Indian market? Is it more to do with corporate governance or to do with the quality of the companies themselves, the qualities of the management compared to you know, the other countries in Asia? Uh, it has to do with uh, three, four different things. I think what what a foreign investor, and actually even a domestic investor, you're a large investor in the country. Uh, what investors typically want is uh, stability uh, and some predictability, right? You can't make investment decisions, particularly from a long-term perspective, if you, if you don't know uh, that things will remain stable or in fact if you believe that there will be um, volatility from a policy perspective or from a tax perspective or something else. So one thing that we have to give confidence to investors is stability and continuity of policy. That I think is exceedingly critical. Um, transaction costs and taxation related matters I would say is the other area where investors have some concerns in terms of uh, you know the cost of doing business in India and the stability of tax policy and whether you know they were they, whether you know whether it's GAR related or some of the other measures whether that is something that uh, could result in any kind of issues uh, going forward. So tax is something that investors worry about. Governance is certainly an important aspect 
and th and there i would say uh, india has come a long way in terms of governance standards over the last decade uh, there is still a long way to go it remains a focus area not only for us for sebi for everybody else fr from a regulatory perspective and even recently you would have seen that uh, sebi has adopted uh, some of the norms of the kotak committee to change uh, some of the governance related framework for corporate india so i think governance is an evolving landscape i think we've made a lot of progress there is still uh, more to go and uh, we're on the right path so from that standpoint i think um, uh, investors should be a lot more comfortable now relative to a decade ago in terms of governance standards and disclosure norms etc so those are some of the issues that uh, that investors worry about the last bit is obviously if you look at it purely from a market perspective then the fp fpis obviously worry about the registration requirements compliance requirements uh, you know what it takes to uh, to trade in india and those also over time have been uh, significantly streamlined by sebi and they are very open minded in bringing about more changes in order to facilitate foreign investment in markets so i think from that standpoint there is uh, overall uh, from a policy perspective i think it's quite clear that india uh, will be an open uh, economy will uh, will encourage foreign investments whether it's fdi or fii and to the extent that there needs to be more streamlining in order to facilitate and ease access to india uh, from a policy perspective both uh, regulators and government are on the same page in terms of uh, the direction of the, of reform so today there's also concern regarding you know liquidity of indian markets being fragmented and moving offshore so what is your take on this yeah so um, it's not uh, so this concern is not unique to india you know the reality is uh, fragmenting liquidity is not good period for for market and investors and um, what the indian exchanges have tried to do is also go along with that principle in terms of trying to see how you can consolidate liquidity the reality is that uh, no other exchange or no other market uh, would necessarily have uh, policies or in fact permit liquidity to move offshore uh, or to develop in other jurisdictions other exchanges also have policies that do not license contracts or, or prices to develop their core contracts offshore because fragmentation doesn't is not good for investors either you get better price discovery and better execution if there is a common liquidity pool rather than the same pool being fragmented in three different areas so uh, i think it's important for us to try and figure out how we consolidate liquidity domestically as well as to the extent that people want to remain offshore and trade in dollar related contracts and all that we now have an international jurisdiction in gift city that provides all the all the tools and all the benefits that anybody would have in any other international juri jurisdiction whether it's from a tax perspective or in terms of operational ease so gift city is now very much on par with any other international jurisdiction so to the extent that people want to trade in india related products but in dollar form with better tax structure etc so that platform is also available in gift city so the idea is to try and consolidate liquidity rather than fragment right and coming to gift city which is in gujarat um, you know so what are the long term plans there you know it's only about a year 18 months old it takes time to build any international jurisdiction it takes time to build any new exchange it takes time to build liquidity uh, so we are doing our bit in terms of trying to do that i think the government is also very focused in terms of providing any kind of facilitation from a policy perspective or from a regulatory perspective to attract investors to uh, locate their offices their trade in uh, gift city etc so i do believe that uh, that uh, jurisdiction will develop and uh, no no okay thanks um that jurisdiction will develop but it will take some time and i think as long as everybody is aligned and everybody is moving in the same direction i think we'll get there but we'll have to be a bit patient so one of the founding principles of the nse was to provide modern fully automated electronic trading you know so in this in today's overly digital world 
What are some of the steps that the NSE is today taking to stay ahead and to stay abreast with cutting edge technology in the space of trading? You know, we've uh, already, when we started life, it was with the notion of disruption. Yeah. And uh, we provided Pan India electronic trading, uh, which at that point in time, when the NSE started, was people were very skeptical about whether this will work and whether this will whether people will really take to it, etc. You should remember that those days, it was also very early days of electronic trading. You didn't really have the kind of technology that you have today. But obviously, um, when you look at the way the NSE has developed, uh, providing Pan-India access um, did take off in a very large way. Uh, today, you have even more sophisticated technology available, and fintech is one area that is developing quite rapidly, not only here, but even internationally. And so we're working with various fintech providers to try and integrate tools, integrate applications that would be more interesting for investors. Uh, the evolution now is uh, in terms of, you know, taking markets to people's homes, which was the original framework in terms of electronic trading, uh, homes or offices, to now more mobile-based um, tools and applications that are available and the ease of trading and the value added analytics that can be provided to every investor. Uh, so those are some of the areas that, uh, that we're uh, working on with fintech companies. Obviously emerging technologies such as blockchain are also important to focus on. We have some pilot programs that are ongoing in terms of the application of blockchain uh, in certain parts of our uh, of our uh, ecosystem. So that is another area that uh, that we're focused on. And talking about emerging technologies, then artificial intelligence is the third area, uh, and machine learning. And the application of that uh, is again important, including in surveillance systems, where we're trying to integrate artificial intelligence, machine learning, social media, along with obviously all the trading data, et cetera, to try and detect patterns and see how from a surveillance perspective we can be more effective. So the use of technology spans various parts of the landscape, not necessarily only from a business perspective, but also from a regulatory perspective. Okay. Well, that's very interesting. And then, you know, become, as we become more dependent on technology, data protection needs to be looked at as well. So what are some of the steps that the NSE is taking to ensure cybersecurity? Yeah, this is um, an important area because you know, the nature of uh, the business and the nature of the platform, 99.9% .9 uptime doesn't work because a 5% disruption is, um, is a significant disruption. Any disruption is a significant disruption. So we have to worry about, um, you know, how we are 100% um, uptime environment. And there are various aspects to ensuring that not only in terms of the robustness of our own systems, but making sure that we are protected from a cybersecurity perspective. That is an area that is getting increasingly complex because of the sophistication of, uh, of players that want to hack as well as the nature of the threat. So very often what we found is that the origin or the kind of players who are involved in cybersecurity attacks very often come from state-sponsored areas. So that has a very different degree of complexity and sophistication that you have to stay ahead of. So we've obviously done everything we can and we spend a lot of time and energy and money in making sure that uh, we have all the firewalls and all the protection and we sign up for the highest standards of cybersecurity. We're obviously in touch with various parts of the Indian system uh, that is focused on cybersecurity from a government perspective, but also internationally in order to make sure that we know what the nature of threats are, this, what is going on from a uh, sophistication perspective internationally, the tools that are available, and various other areas of development in the cybersecurity framework in order to make sure that we stay ahead of the curve. But this is something that, uh, that obviously worries me, worries everybody, uh, because the nature of the threat and the sophistication of the threat is uh, is changing every day and is, is very different. Right. 
So moving away from the NSE in particular, um, you know, how do you think the India story is looking overall? So you know, we may be stepping into a higher interest rate environment after a lot of three to four years. Also, GDP growth now is good, especially in Q4 was good. So you know, do you think India's macro story is catching up with the recovery witnessed in the micros? I think uh, you know what what you've seen over the last two three years is that the government has tried to put in place certain structural reforms um, which will have some near-term negative impact as has been experienced in the economy, but long-term are essential and required. And I think the, the positive impacts of structural reforms are only seen over a period of time. Uh, there are short-term disruptions that we've gone through. My hope is that that's behind us whether it's uh, GST related or otherwise. Uh, but there are various other structural reforms that are still playing out. You're seeing what's going on with the bankruptcy court, the NCLT process. Um, likewise, the real estate regulation is an important reform. Uh, so I think structural reforms are important. Uh, my hope is that the benefits of that we will continue to see over time. Uh, the short-term disruptions that resulted from some of those reforms are hopefully behind us and therefore you're seeing a pickup in growth. I think the March results on balance were, uh, were quite good relative to expectations. You are seeing a pickup in economic activity. Um, and so I think, um, as I said earlier, the macro picture, while it's weakened a little bit relative to, say, a year ago, largely on account of oil prices, um, I think it's still quite stable. The interest rate environment, um, while there's been a small increase in interest rates by the, the Reserve Bank, I think it's important to make sure that monetary policy stays disciplined and focused on inflation because that's the only way that you can achieve sustainable growth. And so you have to be disciplined about it. There are business cycles. It's not a one-way street. And, you know, all of us who've worked in business and in markets understand that you go through these periods um, and that's the reality of business. Right. No, absolutely. So before you took over as the MD of uh, the NSC, you were part of the Supreme Court appointed BCCI's uh, Committee of Administrators. It's, you've also been someone who's been avidly interested in sports since, since your youth. You were a national level tennis player, you used to play cricket as well. So just is curious to understand how was it working in a field that you're so passionate about that the country is so emotionally connected with and yet keeping your emotions away from, from the actual business of the sport? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so it wasn't something that I had anticipated. It uh, came out of the blue, but um, certainly something that I thought was really a, an opportunity for me to contribute and give back to, to sports. Certainly an honor to be asked by the Supreme Court to try and contribute. So, um, a very interesting experience. Uh, what I will say is that the issues that, um, uh, that have been outlined and have been discussed in the press surrounding cricket are actually not unique to cricket. Uh, the same issues apply to many other areas uh, and I would, I would argue most other sports federations uh, in the country, whether it's tennis, boxing, wrestling, hockey, football, whatever it is. So the governance related issues are ones that are important because what ends up happening is that you really have to work in the interest of the sport and do what is important in order to develop talent. And invariably, it gets caught up in the politics and vested interests that are not necessarily working in the interest of the sport. And that, un that is unfortunate because, uh, you know, there is a lot that can be done for sports in India. Look at the number of people we have, the number of uh, people who play sport, and then what our achievements are on the international front, other than cricket, uh, and obviously now increasingly badminton and certain other areas. There is a long way to go in terms of the impact that we can have internationally and, and the achievements that we can show from a sports perspective. But that has to do with sports administration, sports governance, making sure that funds are actually utilized for the purpose that they are meant and not siphoned off and you know, uh, 
used for friends and family, families in terms of businesses and all that. So it was an interesting experience. There's a, there's a lot that can be done. Uh, it does require, you know, some, uh, some changes. And those changes are not easy because, as I described, there are a lot of vested interests. And so unless you break that cycle and actually bring in uh, the right standards of governance and sports administration, uh, I don't think we'll be able to really develop um, the sports infrastructure or develop talent relative to the potential that we have. So, uh, you know, I, my experience was very interesting because I, you get an inside view of what actually happens and, and how vested interests operate and what their motivations are and, and what it takes to try and navigate the landscape to achieve the outcome you want to achieve. Uh, I can tell you that um, obviously uh, there's a long way to go. The committee has not really been able to achieve what it was supposed to achieve. That largely also has to do with the fact that the committee is not fully empowered to just go ahead and do what it is supposed to do because it requires uh, the BCCI and the state bodies to cooperate. Uh, it requires certain things to be passed by the general body of the BCCI. The committee is not empowered to overrule the general body. Uh, only the Supreme Court can overrule the general body and therefore decisions that uh, the committee uh, is required to take, uh, they don't get passed in the general body for obvious reasons. And therefore, it will require the Supreme Court to weigh in and to make sure that those decisions do get implemented. It is obviously taking a lot longer than what anybody would like, but that's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. No, absolutely. Very, very interesting. Uh, so, Vikram, one more question to you before I actually open it up to the floor to ask questions. So. You know, we are primarily an organization of entrepreneurs, both young and old. So what is your message to the young and next-gen entrepreneurs? And what are some of the key learnings from your journey that you would like to share with them? Um, you know, a few things. And, you know, I've never been an entrepreneur. You are an entrepreneur. So, you know, I, for me to give a perspective on entrepreneurship is, uh, is a bit difficult because I've never been through that journey. But some of the, some of the basic principles that I've tried to uh, tried to stand by is A, have a long-term orientation. So even now, when I'm at the NSE, one of the things that I've articulated quite clearly, whether it is to the regulators, to government, or even internally, is that ultimately we have to focus on what is in the long-term interests of markets and the economy, full stop, simple. Because life becomes very simple when you're clear about certain things. What that means is that there could be situations where you have to take a call on whether you want to take a decision that is short-term negative but long-term positive or short-term positive but long-term negative. The second doesn't work for me. And the second doesn't work for me not in a professional context. It has not worked for me in a personal context. So even as I've tried to look at my own journey, that's one principle that I've, I've already, uh, that I've always tried to stand by. You know, even when I decided to do my chartered accountancy, there was an opportunity for me to do it along with my BCom or after my BCom. I chose to do it after my BCom. I could have cut out three years of my, or I could have got into the real world three years earlier as opposed to doing articleship after BCom. The reason I decided to do it after BCom is because of the nature of articleship and training that I would get and the kind of firm that would take me for articleship would have been very different than the kind of firm that would have taken, taken me during BCom. I was fortunate to do my articleship with Arthur Anderson. The kind of training I got positioned me very differently for the rest of my career than trying to save those two, three years of my career by finishing my CA early. So long-term versus short-term orientation is one thing. Second is I think you have to you have to focus on focus on honesty and transparency, and that I think is very critical because credibility capital I think is uh, again going back to my long term orientation. Credibility capital is what is crucial. 
Yeah, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a professional, whether in any walk of life. And credibility capital gets built only if you stay the course based on certain values for the long term. You try and cut corners and there's no shortcut to success. And so you have to do the right thing by all your stakeholders over a long period of time to build that credibility. And therefore, you, you know, it's not an easy path. Uh, but that I think um, over time does pay off. And so, uh, particularly for youngsters, you know, I find not just entrepreneurs, even in the professional world, there is a certain degree of impatience. And everybody's thinking about how to get there quickly. You can't get there quickly. You have to stay the course, you have to develop your skill set, you have to develop your value system, you have to learn, you know, from others, and you'll get there. You try and get there fast, you'll, you won't get there, unfortunately. There is, it is, uh, it is a long road, there is no shortcut. And so I think even from an entrepreneurship perspective, it is a lot of hard work, you have to stay the course, you have to believe in your convictions. Okay, so there will always be a lot of noise around you. You've got to be able to cut through it and stay with your conviction. And you have to be able to stay with that conviction through downturns. It's not always a straight, straight path. Particularly for an entrepreneur, it is, there is a lot of difficulty along the way. You, hear, you look at stories of entrepreneurs, it's not been easy. You just look at the end result, whether it's a successful professional or a successful entrepreneur, and you look at the end result. Nobody really tries to analyze what happened over the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, depending on uh, how old that person is. But there is a lot. So, you know, it's like when you look at the market, and this is the problem at times you have with, uh, you know, people who give you data. So they show you 100-year data, and it looks like a straight line, right? But there is, there is a lot of volatility under, along the way, right? There are severe corrections along the way that when you plot over a hundred year, disappear or uh, appear minor, but they are not minor, it's particularly for people who have gone through that volatility. So it is important to uh, make sure that you stay the course, you believe in your convictions, think about the long term, do the right thing by stakeholders, don't cut corners and really have a strong value system because those are all foundations for success. I mean, there's no other shortcut. No, I think absolutely. Some very interesting takeaways from there and I think personally I'm going to follow quite a few of them. Um, we'd like I'm to now... Sure you're already following them, otherwise you wouldn't be where you are. Thank you. <laughs> we'd like, now like to open it up to the floor for a few questions. We have time for a few questions only, so... Good afternoon, sir. My name is Abhishek Hewar. Yeah, hi. hi. Sir, I wanted to ask whether National Stock Exchange is looking for inorganic growth plants. If so, what sectors and uh, which geographies, whether it is in India outside, because there was an opportunity in Dhaka Stock Exchange as well. So I wanted to your views on that. Yeah, you know, inorganic uh, is something that we're certainly open to. Uh, and inorganic, uh, on two different dimensions. One is on the exchange front. <coughs> uh, we're open to looking at inorganic opportunities. They're not, they're not always easy, particularly internationally, because what ends up happening is exchanges are viewed as national assets, right? So very often politics gets in the way. It's very difficult to get a significant stake or a majority stake. It's like I don't think the government would allow a majority stake in the National Stock Exchange. Likewise, if we have to take a majority stake in some foreign exchange, it's not that easy to do. Uh, to your example, on the, on the Dhaka Stock Exchange, obviously we did bid for that. Uh, it was only up to a 25% stake, wasn't a majority. But we did get outbid by the Chinese by a very wide margin. Uh, but we will keep looking at international opportunities, even on the non-exchange side, there could be interesting opportunities. So NSE has a lot of non-exchange businesses. We have a data business, an index business, an IT business, an education business. So there could be inorganic opportunities to grow those areas as well. So we are open to both sets of opportunities, whether domestic or internationally, on the exchange front as well as on the non-exchange front. Hi, Vikram. Hi. My name is Harsh Podar. 
uh, I really enjoyed as an entrepreneur some of the things you had to say on uh, you know patience, convictions, long-term orientation. So I really could uh, connect with all that you said there. As an entrepreneur, uh, one of the things you mentioned uh, to develop entrepreneurship and business in the country is access to capital. And we talked about the over-reliance on banks yeah, as uh, access for debt capital in our country. Could you talk a little bit about what is it that we can do to develop the bond markets a little bit and create an alternative means of uh, debt financing for companies? Yeah, so there's a lot that's uh, going on. And, I, and you know, if you've seen the progress of the bond market over the last couple of years, the issuance in the bond market has picked up quite significantly. In fact, I think last year was the first year where uh, when you look at the credit growth in the environment, there was more that came from bonds than bank financing. So in the last couple of years, the, the issuance of bonds has picked up quite significantly. Uh, that also has to do with the stress levels in the banking system and therefore uh, more money coming from the bond market also in an environment where interest rates were much lower. Now as interest rates pick up, you know, that mix could shift. Uh, as far as um, the liquidity in the bond market is concerned, I think there's still a long way to go. Um, the average daily trading volumes in corporate bonds is only about five, 6,000 crores a day, which is very small. And it's all, again, largely OTC. There is a lot that's in the works in terms of trying to get more liquidity in the corporate bond market. And we just launched a tri-party repo platform day before yesterday, which actually would facilitate uh, market participants uh, to try and get financing against their corporate bond portfolios. And that's one way to provide liquidity and get greater interest in bond markets. Likewise, there has been talk about how do you try and consolidate issuances so that you get some minimum amount of liquidity. What ends up happening in, in bonds is that every time you do a new issue, becomes a different series, becomes a different instrument. Now you've raised 500 crores in that issue. That's not going to trade, right? So if you consolidate issuances, then you get some certain minimum critical mass for trading to develop in that particular instrument. Likewise, you need to develop an ecosystem where you have more than just buy and hold investors, right? So it, invariably what ends up happening is many of the frequent issuers that issue bonds, they get placed into insurance companies and provident funds and all that. That paper never comes back to the market. You try and figure out how do these entities, who are long-term investors, there's no reason for them to sell. They are in it for the long term. How do they lend those securities and provide more liquidity? Not dissimilar to the stock lending and borrowing program, where if LIC is sitting on a large inventory of equity that it doesn't want to sell, can certainly lend that stock for somebody who needs to borrow, There's somebody who's going to hedge, somebody who's short, somebody who needs the stock. You can facilitate liquidity in multiple ways. Now, what I'll say is that I think over the, in, in the last 12 months, there have been many developments to try and develop the bond market. Next 12 months, you will see even more because both the regulators, SEBI and RBI, are, are quite focused and aligned on development of the bond market. The other point I would make is, you know, like I mentioned about the eMERGE platform for IPOs for SME companies. We have a similar platform for uh, discounting receivables of MSMEs and SMEs that we have in, uh, in a joint venture uh, with SIDBI called RxIL, which is again an electronic platform for bill discounting of MSMEs and SMEs. That has a long way to go, okay, relative to the volumes that you have on the platform today versus what can happen. Uh, and that I think will provide MSMEs and SMEs again an attractive and faster way to get their working capital cycle by discounting their bills through an electronic platform. Yeah, so that is again what we actually, we launched that only a month ago. You know, the, the retail investments in G6 through the non-competitive bidding framework. Uh, it's only a month old. Uh, I think that is something that needs to be pushed. There needs to be more education and awareness because those who are in investing or those who are putting money in fixed deposits, there's no reason why they shouldn't take uh, government of India risk. Actually, the interest rate now on the government bond is more than 8%. I don't think you get more than 8% in a fixed deposit. So those who are looking at fixed deposits as, uh, as, uh, as their investments, they can certainly also look at government bonds. 
uh, all the trading members, brokers, etc., also need to actively push the the bond market in terms of uh, as a viable alternative to fixed deposits. And I'm sure that will also happen now that there is an electronic platform available for retail investors to participate in government securities. I think we can take another two more questions. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Yeah. Hi. Uh, sir, as uh, you are the veteran in the market, what we see that in last one decade, many top sectors have been sidelined and many new sectors like automobile or FMCG sectors have emerged. So uh, by the perspective of an investor, what do you see? Which investors, which sectors do you see that as an emerging sector in the next decade? So I wouldn't say that uh, sectors have been sidelined. You know, it's a function of what is actually going on in the economy. So if you were to reflect back and look at, say, the 2000 and, I don't know, 6 to 2010 time frame, right? All the infrastructure sectors were exceedingly active. Whether it's construction, power, roads, you know, all the cement, or that was a function of the real activity in the economy, whether it's construction related or infrastructure related. I don't think that's disappeared. It is taken a backseat, unfortunately, because of the issues facing infrastructure or the issues facing real estate. Those sectors are not disappearing. I think they will come back. And when they come back, the equity, uh, the companies that are focused on that, if they're listed companies, their equity, uh, their, their stocks will again be in favor and people will want to invest in those sectors, etc. Having said that, obviously, it is, it is true that what, which sectors lead the market in different business cycles are different. And what kind of valuations different sectors get do change and evolve depending on what's going on in the landscape. So as we've seen even in the United States, I think seven out of the top ten companies are technology companies. Um, that has to do with the impact of technology and, and, and what kind of um, valuation and what kind of value, not valuations, what kind of value those companies really bring to the real economy. Uh, I don't want to get into whether those valuations are fair, unfair, what the right valuation is. It's not my call. There are people who are determining that every day, every month, every second in the market. Um, but my point is that it is really a reflection of what is the value add over the next 5-10 years that a sector brings to the economy and what the prospects for that sector and company are over the you know, next 5 years and that's what results in investor demand, investor appetite, valuations, etc. It has to be anchored by some underlying growth and that is the crux of what drives even sector rotation and whether a sector is in and out of favor. But as a trend, I think there will be um, newer sectors that emerge, but they will not emerge, uh, they could emerge as they did, even in the tech bubble, as just, uh, you know, flavor of the month here, but that's not sustainable. The sustainability of a sector will necessarily have to be grounded in the real value that they bring and what they can demonstrate. So it might be the case that for three months, six months, one year, something is in favor, but for it to remain sustainable, for people to invest in it over time on a sustained basis, you have to show some, you have to demonstrate some results and some value that you bring to companies and to people, right? Otherwise, it's not sustainable. And just one last question, Mr. Mehta. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, sir, with uh, Sebi putting so many uh, companies recently under the additional surveillance measures, um, it obviously causes a sense of panic amongst the retail investors. So you as an exchange, how would you uh, deal with it in terms of providing a sense of certainty, like how things would be dealt with or the timeline for, uh, for the retail investors and also with the companies who have actually performed quite well in the past few quarters? So you know, this is uh, part of what I mentioned earlier in terms of stability and clarity of policy and um, obviously there is a discussion uh, that is ongoing with SEBI in terms of what the perception of risk is, where are the, uh, what are the areas where risk is increasing, how is that systemic risk to be controlled, how can market manipulation be controlled depending on 
what's going on in certain areas, the volume of, that is available in certain stocks, etc. Uh, I think it's it's better for everybody, including the regulator. I don't think the regulator w the regulator would also prefer a more stable regime in terms of uh, regulation and policy. But if you see certain risks emanating in the market, you have to you have to act and over time my hope is that some of these things will get folded into a more broad-based holistic view of risk uh, and therefore regulation that could build in some of the things that have been done based on reacting to uh, where risk is emanating versus a more holistic view of risk management for the system that builds in some of these features but you cannot take away uh, the possibility that depending on what's going on in the market, there will be measures that the regulator would take. I mean, that, that will always be the case. As long as there is transparency and clarity in terms of why something has been done and, uh, and why it's important to control systemic risk. No, thank you so much, Vikram. I think Thanks. And, and please join me. I take this opportunity in expressing my sincerest gratitude to Vikram no, for no, taking pleasure. time out pleasure. and being Thank here you. today. I think it's been a very, very enriching session. Uh, gotten to know a lot more about the plans of the NSC. Um, it's, it's very heartening to know your bullish um, expectations from India and the India growth story. So I think that's very heartening as well. And I think my personal takeaways from today are what you share as, as, as lessons for us, I think, is really to f have the courage to follow through with your convic convictions. Um, to think of the long term and to trade the short term for the long term and to actually kind of build a credibility capital. So thank you so thanks, much. Thanks, thanks, Shashwat. It's really been a pleasure and thanks, an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.